Okay, so this is going to be 7.4 Newton's second law for uniform circular motion. So uniform circular motion, uh, meaning that it, it still does have centripetal acceleration. <clears throat> okay. So the first thing we should note is that this centripetal acceleration can only exist if there is um, something causing it. So some physical or external force, maybe not physical, but some force um, acting on the object. So for, for example, if we have uh, a car driving around a road, or I'll say car driving in a circle, then there is centripetal acceleration pointing to the center of the circle. But what is causing it? In this case, it's the friction on the tires because the car, it, we are trying to get the car to turn. <clears throat> so the friction, uh, the, the push is, is going this way to keep the, so, so we're pushing against the ground to get it to turn this way. So friction is pointing in towards the center. So friction causes, now this is, uh, this is on a flat road. This is on a flat road. Later we'll do an example for a car on an incline. Uh, that's a different case. So this is a flat road. Friction causes the centripetal acceleration. Um, you can also have a object tied to a string, maybe from some center here, and we have some object tied to a string being spun in a circle. Oops, spun, spun in a circle. So here it was friction causing the uh, centripetal acceleration. Over here it's a tension force. So centripetal acceleration and centripetal forces are just a collection of new forces. All they mean is some force that points towards the center of a circle. <clears throat> could be friction, could be tension force, could be um, gravity, So speaking of gravity, maybe we have the Earth and then some satellite orbiting, some satellite orbiting around the Earth, then there is still centripetal acceleration since it's moving in a circle. And what force is pointing towards the center of the Earth for, for this satellite orbiting the Earth? Well, it's gravity, right? Gravity. Or maybe I should say technically gravitational force, but I'll just say gravity causes the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so then we have the centripetal force. So net, so anytime there's a, an acceleration, we can say there is a force. So the net centripetal force due to uh, centripetal acceleration. So the net centripetal force, so remember this, this means center seeking points towards the center is going to be, well, so we'll denote it as F sub C for centripetal is equal to M times, so MA, it's just MA, except the, A sub, the, the acceleration is centripetal acceleration. So that makes sense. And um, we actually had a definition for, for um, this A sub C in terms of the velocity and radius, the, the uh, tangential velocity and the radius of the circle. And that was V squared over R.
So that's coming from the definitions from 7.3. So now we have uh, two different interpretations here uh, for the overall centripetal force. <coughs> So sometimes as well we can have a so-called centrifugal force, which is really like a, I mean it can exist, but I don't think we'll do a lot with it. And there's not like in a, uh, an equation with this or anything, but it's just another classification of forces. And this is a, um, instead of a center seeking, it's, it's going the, the opposite way. So we can say center fleeing. So these forces do exist. <clears throat> the book gives an example of a like the normal force that prevents an object from falling towards the center of the sur uh, towards the center of the earth or um, the forces between two particles with the same sign charge. So it, it kind of have to set it up to, to be able to argue that something is a centrifugal force, but often we won't really, uh, as far as I can tell, we won't really use this terminology too much, but it's just nice to point out, since we're pointing out centripetal force, and then we have this contrasting uh, centrifugal force here. Uh, we should say that um, <clears throat> Centripetal acceleration is negative because, so we have to define some sort of um, sign rule for uh, having this kind of circular motion and we've defined motion around the circle counterclockwise to be positive and counterclockwise to be negative but what about the motion in or out of the circle so we define in to be negative oops towards the center and then if a centrifugal force does come up which again I don't think it will or a centrifugal acceleration is positive. Because it points away from the center. <clears throat> so I put it in quotes there because a lot of times where you think centrifugal acceleration exists, it really doesn't. Like if you're on a merry-go-round spinning really fast and you think you, you, when you're standing on it, you feel like you're being pushed outwards. Like if you let go of the handle that you would fly straight out, right? But remember that we decided last time that that's not what happens. When something is spinning in a circle and it lets go, it goes off tangentially to the circle wherever it lets go. It doesn't go straight out. Right, so that's why in a lot of cases you think there's, centri there's centrifugal forces and centrifugal acceleration, but most of the, well, a lot of times it's actually not there. In fact, some sources that you look up will even say that this is a made up acceleration or a made up force. Um, yeah, so it's a little, little subtle there. All right, let's see. <clears throat> So now that we have this sign convention and the definition of a centripetal force, we can define the sum of the forces in the radial direction. So just like we had sum of the forces in x direction equals ma or zero, depending, all this force diagram stuff um, can, can come into play here now. We say that the sum of the forces in the radial direction now, instead of x or y, the radial direction is going to be equal to negative m. It's just the centripetal force. It's just the, the negative of the centripetal force. Again, ignoring that centrifugal force. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, so let's work this problem to help uh, consider how these uh, new force diagrams are going to go. So they do give us a picture here for this. It says a car travels at a constant speed of 30 miles an hour or 13.4 meters per second on a level circular turn of radius 50 meters. What minimum coefficient of static friction mu sub s between the tires and the road will keep the car from sliding. So they give us a so-called bird's eye view, meaning just a view from above of the car here. So here's the car and they go ahead and draw the friction force uh, vector. So I'll say f sub f sub s for static friction force. Uh, going perpendicular, right? Well, it's uh, well rather it points towards the center, right? This is the centripetal. Uh, this is going to represent the centripetal force. <coughs> um, uh, it is static friction technically when you're talking about rolling things, um, because the uh, kinetic friction is for when something is sliding. Uh, sliding across like this, whereas something that's rolling, only one part of it is ever touching the surface. So it's not that it's sliding as it rolls, it's like replacing itself with a new part of the tire as it rolls. So technically the friction is static friction. Now if you're rolling along and then you lock up your brakes, you lock up your tires and then you start sliding or, or you slide sideways in your car, then that becomes kinetic friction. But if the tires are rolling, then that's technically static friction. So that's why they're asking for static friction here. All right. Okay, so let's, the, the, the book provides some problem solving strategies. Uh, it says step one is to draw a free body diagram. So we could draw a free, a free body diagram here. Um, I know if I'm getting friction involved, I probably need to get the normal force involved and all that. So let me, uh, instead of having the top down view of the car, I'll draw the car like here and I'll draw its normal force and its gravitational force here. So here's, uh, how do we denote, how do we, I think we say F sub N and then MG and then there is the friction which I will draw pointing to the left because it fits the convention that this should end up being negative, right? So this will be my friction force. All right. I should think, is there any other force acting here? No, this is, this is everything that's acting on this, uh, on this object. Okay, it says step two is to choose a coordinate system. Now, this is kind of getting into the issue, and it won't be an issue here. Pretty easy to define that, or to realize that we should define our coordinate system as, um, you know, the x-axis right here, right right through the thing like this, and our y-axis, I mean, how else would you do it, right? So there's our x and y axis. Um, but later we'll see problems where things are tilted, and we'll have to, just like when we put things on ramps, you have to decide how to tilt your coordinate axes, and then what vectors need to be decomposed. Um, That'll come up here as well, but not in this particular problem. So defining the coordinate axes is not really much of a big deal. <clears throat> Step three, they say find the net force F sub C toward the center of the circular path. Okay. Well, I know from the definition earlier, but by Newton's uh, law, second law, the sum of the forces in the radial direction is equal to the centripetal force, the, the negative um, m v squared over r, but according to my equation here, the only thing going on in that direction is that friction force. So I have f sub f sub s equals negative m v squared over r, but I've forgotten one thing which is that my friction force is going in the negative negative direction. <clears throat> so the sum of my forces in the radial direction cannot be zero. 
like they they'll be zero in the y direction here because the object is not lifting up or down but the if something's moving in a circle then that centripetal acceleration exists hence the force exists it is not going to be zero it's going to be equal to whatever uh, well it's going to be equal to this quantity so you take anything going on in that radial direction meaning the um, these the x direction as I've put it here and set them equal to that and in this case there's only one force right just the friction force and now from here I say alright need my friction force but this is kinda standard at this point we know that um, first of all minus signs are gonna go away right uh, the friction force is equal to the normal force times whoops, normal force times that coefficient so that tells me I need to go find my normal force but I know that the sum of the forces in the y direction or well let's see yeah all right are equal to zero uh, so that means okay so f sub n minus mg is equal to zero long story short that normal force is equal to mg which is always true if you're on a flat level surface so that means over here I have mg mu sub s which is what I'm solving for equal to mv squared over r a little bit of algebra canceling the m's mu sub s should equal v squared over rg just by some algebra there but the m's cancel on both sides and then divide by g and that'll give you the solution which is once we plug things in so it, all these numbers are given v is 13.4 r is 50 g is of course 9.8 and we're getting a coefficient of static friction the maximum coefficient static friction that will keep this car um, or sorry the minimum the minimum that will keep the car from uh, sliding will be 0 0.366 so any sl more slippery and the car uh, its speed is too great and it will end up sliding a bit instead of maintaining that grip on the road and turning uh, in a circle okay so there are some remarks after this problem that I think are worth looking at which uh, they say the value of mu sub s for rubber on dry concrete, which is what we drive on, right? Rubber tires on dry concrete or asphalt is very close to 1. So that means that all this car needs is this, 0.366. But on a road with rubber tires, it's closer to 1, which means that this is fine. This this car can it is not going to slip on a regular road. However, if the roads are icy, then that coefficient of static friction goes all the way down to like 0.2 or even lower. So this car would be in trouble going this fast around a turn of this radius. Right? If if the roads were icy and slick and they were trying to go 30 miles an hour around this uh circular turn that has a radius of 50 meters, they would slide. <clears throat> then there's a question that says if the static friction well, let's see if I show it here if the static friction coefficient was increased or were increased would the maximum safe speed be reduced increased or remain the same okay well it would be increased right because um, well we can actually see the mathematical relationship here that if this increases then this will also increase as long as r is staying the same the radius is which it is that that's implied by this question so we can see that these two things are directly related not inversely related they're directly related And then the second question, or rather like a follow-up question says, at what maximum speed can a car negotiate a turn on a wet road with coefficient of static friction 0 0.230 without sliding out of control? The radius is 25 meters. So if we were to do that one, 
we would say we could use this same relationship here and say mu sub s is equal to v squared over rg. So this is a nice relationship that will hold for a car on a flat road. <clears throat> Finding the coefficient of static friction. This is a nice equation that kind of relates all these things that are that are going on here on a flat road. So if we know the coefficient we want to find v, so we'll solve for v here, so I'll have mu sub s times rg is equal to v squared and then v then is equal to the square root of mu sub s rg and then we could just plug in for the values they give 0 0.2 230 for mu, r is 25, g is 9.8, and apparently v will end up equaling 7.51 meters per second. Okay, and I just checked and that's what I got as well, 7.51 meters per second. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to look at this problem, which is a car this time going on, uh, on along a sloped <coughs> road. So it says the Daytona International Speedway in Daytona Beach is famous for its races, blah 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 blah. Both of its courses feature four-story, 31-degree banked curves. So that's huge. Four-story, that means they're like, at the highest point, they're 40 feet tall. So it's a huge ramp. Uh, yeah, with a maximum radius of 316 meters. So banked curves means the cars go around the the curve and, the, and instead of the curve being flat which would be harder to deal with the curve is sloped like this so that the cars can come at it really fast and and still be able to maintain control uh, if a car ne negotiates the curve too slowly uh, that just means if it goes around it too slowly it tends to slip down the incline whereas if it goes too fast it may begin to slide up the incline so as it's coming around this curve, if it goes, so like some curve like this, if it goes too slow, it starts to fall down the hill, and if it goes too fast, it might go up and hit the wall or something like that. So there is some maximum speed, or maybe acceleration, uh, yeah, in fact, that's what they're asking for. Find the necessary centripetal acceleration on this curve so the car won't slip down or slide up. And it says to neglect friction and then to calculate the speed of the car. So um, it says neglect friction so you might say well what the heck is going to keep it but where is the centripetal acceleration coming from at all? Well, it's coming from the slope. It's coming from the, the angle of the curve. If there was no friction and this was on flat ground, then the car would not go in a circle. It would just go straight tangentially you know, with, with no centripetal acceleration. But since the ground has been angled up, <coughs> the, that will contribute a centripetal acceleration. Now in the real world there's also friction also pulling in so there would be two centripetal accelerations, two centripetal forces coming from the slope of the ground and the friction but in this case they were kind of nice and let us ignore friction. Okay, so let's see what we can do here. The first step is to draw a diagram. Okay, and I lost all the other pages. Okay, so we'll draw a free body diagram, which they kind of already gave us a picture to look at, so I'll kind of go based off of that. So I'll draw my car here. <coughs> now, nope, that's not what I want to do. The car is sloped. The car is sloped, so this is the slope here, where, and this is the ground, so this is 31 degrees right there, 31.0 degrees, and I've got um, 
let's see, just because this picture might end up getting a little cramped, I'll use different colors to make this stand out. I'm going to have my MG always pointing straight down. I'm going to have my normal force that's always pointing perpendicular to the ground. So these are, this one's pointing straight down, and this one's pointing over here at some angle. Uh, that's my normal force. Okay. And that's it. Which seems strange, but that is it because there's no friction, right? So this is it. <coughs> they tell us now to choose a coordinate system. That is going to be a very important a uh, very important step here, choosing our coordinate system, because that is going to, sorry, I'm trying to find, I've got pages mixed up here. That's gonna determine which one of these vectors needs to be broken down, because one of them definitely has to be broken down. So we'll do it the same way that they did it, where they let, uh, well, what did they do? So they kept their coordinate axes like this, where this is x and this is y. So that means that this normal force vector needs to be decomposed. <clears throat> Which is a little bit strange. Uh, that's maybe not how we typically have done these before. Typically we would decompose the mg vector, but just for the sake of following along with the way that they've done this in the in the text, I'll I'll uh, keep it like this. So we need to decompose this vector here because mg is right along the y-axis, so that's not a problem. It's the normal force um, vector that needs to be decomposed. So we need to think about the geometry happening here and what angle is being made here or here. All right. So th that's going to be a little bit easier if I draw redraw this normal force vector like here and then redraw the so the normal force should always be perpendicular to the ground, right? So here's the ground, like the ramp rather. I mean the ramp, the the surface. So this is perpendicular. And then this is the angle with the, the of the ramp there. That's the 31 degrees. And I'm looking for well, what am I looking for? I need some sort of angle dealing with uh, the normal force. <clears throat> now here's my x-axis here. There's my x and my y-axis. And I know that this is 31 degrees, and then this is a 90 degree angle. Hmm, so what can I say about this angle then? Or maybe this angle? Well. So one way to think about this is to think about these two axes, the, the ground and, or not axes, but these two lines, the, the, the slope here and the normal force, if they were tilted back here and then and now they're tilted 31 degrees here, so maybe that like you can imagine it that way. Or, or um, another way is to think about if this is 31 degrees, then by definition this one here is also 31 degrees. Right. That's that's just using this rule where if you have two parallel lines cut like that, um, then these two angles are the same. That's what's happening there. So <clears throat> this one's 31 degrees, but overall from this black line to this black line is 90 degrees, meaning that this angle here must complete the 90 degrees, so it's uh, 59 degrees. And then thus finally, now from this black line to this black line is another 90 degree angle, so this right here must be another 31 degrees. So now we have some options. It, it, it depends on how we want to draw the triangle. I'll draw it with the 31 degree angle. So I have my normal force here 
and I have this side and this side and there's my 31 degree angle now I know it's 31 degrees in there this is the uh, X side and the Y side so X is going to be um, opposite so sine of 31 degrees is equal to opposite over hypotenuse so it's going to be F sub N sine theta and y oh and it's negative right because it's pointing to the left it's or you can think about this as being in the second quadrant too but the the point is it's pointing to the left so this would be negative though they didn't put that oh yeah they did okay and then the y is going to be f sub n cosine theta where the theta is the 31 degrees I should have written that there just to emphasize that's the 31 degrees and the hypotenuse is of length f sub n so that's where I'm getting these these are just coming from sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse and then just multiplying hypotenuse on both sides to solve for that opposite side and adjacent side so you see here that you know with this angle being used that uh, again the the sine versus cosine relationship with x versus y is a little bit mixed up here because of the geometry you know we tend to like to have x associated with cosine and y to be associated with sine but it just depends on how the angles are given and how you decide to build your triangle so if you decided to instead build the triangle like this where this is f sub n and you went this way with it then your angle here would be 51 degrees and this would be y and this would be x and x would be negative fn cosine of 51 degrees so this time theta being 51 degrees and y would be fn sine of 51 degrees whereas up here with the way the book did it and the way I did it here in red we're getting x is equal to negative fn of um, sine of 31 degrees and y is equal to fn of cosine of 31 degrees so remember that if the trig functions swap then the angle the complementary angle must also swap so I'm gonna do the calculations with these just because that's the way the book did it and it's just easier to follow along with their numbers if I do it the way they did it <clears throat> okay so now I've got this uh, normal force decomposed into an X and a Y component so it's X component along here is um, negative FN sine of 31 degrees and its y component here is positive fn cosine of 31 degrees decompose that red vector into these two pieces okay so part a of this question recall said to find the centripetal acceleration necessary to keep this thing from slipping so all of this is just building up the force diagram and also choosing the coordinate system. So now we need to start talking about the sum of the forces and the different directions and such. Okay. So sort of the the key thing here is that the the only acceleration going on should be the centripetal acceleration. We should have no acceleration in the y direction because they don't want the car sliding up or down the hill. So there should be no y direction acceleration so that lets us set up the uh, sum of the forces in the y direction should be equal to zero which means that n sorry f sub n cosine 31 degrees is equal to well yeah is equal to mg I should really say minus mg equals zero I accidentally skipped that step uh, it should be this minus mg equals zero and then of course from there you solve that equation to get this and uh, 
we can we can leave it like this we don't know maybe we need the normal force we probably will because it's involved here so maybe I should just go ahead and solve for the normal force and say mg over cosine of 31 degrees okay so I could go ahead and calculate that but I'll just sort of leave that be for now now I'll look at the things going on in the x direction now in my picture I'm only seeing one force in the x direction, the x component of the normal force, this negative fn sine 31 degrees. And that's okay, that's what I want. <clears throat> so I'm going to have the sum of the forces in the radial direction. So radial here meaning like the x direction. Okay, that's the direction radial to the circle. So if you imagine it, the picture from above, this is pointing in towards the center of the circle. And I want the sum of those to just be ma sub c. So in the last problem, I used the mv squared over r. That's just because they were asking for velocity, I think. Or they were, uh, velocity was given or something like that. In this problem, they're asking for the centripetal acceleration. So that's why I've used this form of this to get that centripetal acceleration involved. And moreover, I know that the only radial force is this Fn sine 31. So that means negative Fn sine of 31 degrees is equal to Ma sub C. That's the only force in the radial direction. And it's equal to the overall centripetal force. <clears throat> okay, but I know that I'm looking for a sub c, so I can say a sub c is equal to negative f sub n sine of 31 degrees all over um, m. Okay, and then from here it's just kind of algebra. Look, I've got I've got f sub n here. I can plug that in. So plugging in f this f sub n. This F sub n right here, I'm getting um, mg over cosine of 31 degrees, oh, negative, uh, times sine of 31 degrees all over m. Oh, this is, I forgot to write a sub c equals, so I'll write it on this side. And then a sub c then is equal to so they clean it up real nice, and uh, this is this is kind of nice if you um, you could just plug everything in at this point, I suppose. But the m's will cancel, the g will stick around, so I'll have a negative g sticking around, and sine of 31 over cosine of 31, if you recall from trig, is equal to tangent of 31 degrees. So, you know, if you had already calculated this as some number early on, and then you just stuck this in there that's fine too but the cleanest way of doing it is to not plug in any numbers really until and not to get the calculator out until the very last step <clears throat> so by the way the answer here is a negative um, 5.89 meters per second squared fitting the bill that centripetal acceleration, a center-seeking acceleration should be negative. Okay, now part B of this question, or of this exercise, so this was all part, part A. The question, part A said find, oof, Find the necessary centripetal acceleration on the curve so the car won't slip up or down the incline. So again, we did that. How did we get that not sliding up or down the incline involved? Well, that was straight from setting the sum of the forces in the y direction equal to zero, meaning we don't want this sliding up or down the hill, just right down the center. <clears throat> Part B just says to calculate the speed of the race car. Well, that's nice. That is so nice and easy compared to all of this force diagram stuff. Part B will just be that um, the 
well, there's actually a couple ways I guess we could do it. Um, but the easiest way is to say that a sub c, oh yeah, that's the easiest way, a sub c is equal to negative v squared over r. So that gives us that v is equal to square root of negative r So that negative is going to make sure that this ends up being positive because the a sub c is negative, right? So that's going to give us that v is equal to, so square root of negative um, r was the radius of the circle, which was 316 meters, times that centripetal acceleration we just found. And that's going to give us v is 43.1 meters per second. Cool. So this follow-up question at the bottom says, oh yeah, they make the same remark I made a second ago, which is that uh, in fact both banking, which is the angle of the, the slope, and friction assist in keeping the race track, I mean the race car on the track. What three physical quantities determine the minimum and maximum safe speeds on a banked racetrack? So first of all, you've got the slope of the ramp, right? That's That came up straight up in the acceleration formula. That angle was directly related there. So the slope matters. Coefficient of static friction very much matters. That was not involved here, but it would matter in the real world and also the radius of the track because we can see here that V is directly related to the radius. So if it's a very small radius, they're not going to be able to go as fast because they can't whip around that corner as fast. If it's a very large radius, you can go around it faster. And that's why they let this radius be huge so that the cars can go around it quite fast. And 31 degrees is a really big angle too for a car to be, I mean, it's, that's, that's a steep angle to be in a car doing that. So um, it's built so that they can go around it very quickly. All right. <clears throat> so the last problem, well, yeah, the last problem in this section deals with, this is a classic problem of a, um, what's it called, a roller coaster and uh, how much um, speed a roller coaster needs in order to whip around a, uh, a loop like this without falling down um, and also being unassisted by the tracks. Meaning like if you were to just launch something that's not attached to the track via any mechanism and just launch it around this loop, what is the minimum speed it would need to, to go around this loop uh, without just coming around and falling. <clears throat> um, so this one I think would be good to work out together in person. Um, I mean I could work it out here but also it deals they want us to find the total or uh, the the velocity at the bottom using uh, conservation of energy so that'll be a good review of that as well. So I think I'm going to save this one and we can talk about it in person. I will say though that um, if you look at one of these, the thing that's happening at the top, which is strange, is that, let's see, what is happening at the top? Okay, right, so in this particular problem, they want the, the car to be able to go around the track with no help from, or around the loop with no help from the track. So this relationship tells us that the normal force is uh, going to be zero. So just the, the centripetal force then is coming from the gravitational force. And even though it's pointing down, right, the thing still manages to get around the loop if it has enough speed. <clears throat> okay, so that's a little bit, it's a strange problem. So I think we'll work that out uh, in person. <clears throat>